Let's have the next child. Look, everybody! Simpson's in a contest with children! Hey, shh! You're making us miss the contest. Could you explain your model, young man? What's to explain? He's an idiot! Pipe down! How many people died because of Chernobyl? According to the official Soviet count, unchanged since 1987, the death count is 31. Two people died immediately, 29 people died in hospital. But that's a filthy, stinky, commie, stinky, dodgy commie number. Surely there's more reliable data out there. Well, in 2005, the UN released a report looking to put a definitive number on Chernobyl's death toll. They found only 50 deaths as of 2005 could be directly attributed to the disaster, with a further 4,000 deaths predicted as a result of radiation exposure. In 2006, the UN updated their number of direct deaths from 50 to 54. So, there you have it. 54, rising to 4,000 over this century. The definitive, totally uncontroversial number that definitely puts to rest a completely uncontentious subject. Okay everyone, thanks for watching. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe button, click the bell, give me all your money on Patreon, and listen to the Love and Content Podcast. No, but really though, please support Fickle Clown Economics by giving me all your money on Patreon. I'm not pretty enough for OnlyFans and the things I want to make don't really fit with their business model anyway. Uh, also, go check out the Love and Content Podcast. It's really good and my friend slash I guess producer had a really fun time making it. I even put a little card up in the corner for you to click so there's no excuse. It, it's a good podcast. We got chemistry. You grab a little beaker, stir it round, what you got, boom, chemistry. I'm plugging this podcast instead of getting paid to plug Raid Shadow Legends. Yeah, I got approached by the meme sponsor. I'm not even kidding. I got an email from Raid Shadow Legends to plug their gas. Is that it? Is what it? That. Is that it? Is you're not going to dig into this? No. But hey, if you want to look into it, be my guest. Yeah. Yeah, all right. No one cared who I was till I put on the mask. Soup the camera's on. I know it's on. I know Kurtzkazak did a video on this topic already, and don't worry, this isn't just gonna rehash their video. Though I understand we all draw from the same well. I actually wanted to approach this from a completely different angle. See, when we ask the question, how many people died because of Chernobyl, or even what were the consequences of Chernobyl, we're not really asking that. Put a pin in that, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> oh, you better believe we'll come back to that later. Right now, let's just look at the health aspects of Chernobyl, specifically bad health outcomes. Like death. Chernobyl was, by some margin, the worst nuclear disaster in the history of humankind. People don't seem to realize how world-changing the Chernobyl nuclear disaster actually was, including, but not limited to, Oh, I thought there was more than that. One of the major sticking points around Chernobyl is its overall death toll. There have been numerous attempts to calculate the long-term death toll caused by the Chernobyl nuclear accident, and all of them have produced very different numbers. The 2005 World Health Organization projected death rate stands at between 4 and 9,000. Estimates from the International Journal of Cancer put the projected death toll at 16,000 by 2065. The Union of Concerned Scientists estimated the projected global death toll at 27,000. The Ukrainian NRCRM says the Ukrainian government pays widow benefits to more than 35,000 people who have partners with deaths related to the Chernobyl catastrophe, which puts a death toll at 36,525 for Ukraine alone. A report commissioned by European Green Groups in the EU Parliament, conducted by radiation scientist Ian Farrelly, um, I have since learned that it is pronounced fairly, not Farrelly. Puts us in good stead for all the Russian names, doesn't it? Put the projected death toll between 30 and 60,000. They updated this in 2016 and revised their number down to 40,000, arguing that Cardis's paper on the subject had an uncertainty between 6,000 and 38,000 due to the difficulty projecting long-term cancer rates and mortality linked to Chernobyl. Shockingly for the Greens, they chose the higher estimate. Greenpeace, perhaps unsurprisingly, put their number at 93,000 for cancer-related deaths and 200,000 excess deaths. One very controversial report by Yapkolov in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences estimated between 112 and 125,000 people had died by 2005, and the wider death toll could be up to a million people. Put a pin in that, we're coming back to it. No scientific report has put the numbers anywhere in the range of what Greenpeace and Yablokov are proposing, and I'm not going to treat them with any sort of legitimacy here. But even so, that's a huge spread in numbers from papers within the bounds of scientific possibility. So, what's going on? Why is there so much spread in the data? 
Calculating the Chernobyl death toll actually requires a few things. First, we need to establish what actually causes deaths in nuclear accidents. Beyond grievous bodily harm caused by any explosion, one of the major concerns for people is radiation. High energy radiation, called ionizing radiation, has enough energy to damage the DNA in your cells, and that can lead to things like cancer. And death. Our best data on what radiation exposure does to a person comes from atomic bomb survivors from Japan, high level exposure of full body external radiation. But we've known about the dangers of low level radiation exposure for a while. In the book Radium Girls, historian Kate Moore tells the story of the women employed in the radium dial factories, painting watches and dials on military equipment. Radium was useful for military equipment because it glows in the dark. The paint got on their hands, into their hair, and it settled onto their clothes. The women who worked in these factories were even told to lick the tips of the paintbrushes to get them to fine points. They would literally glow in the dark. The body mistakes radium for calcium. These women's bones had absorbed an unknown amount of radium, and radium is radioactive. Years later, these women would document mysterious illnesses, skin not healing, brittle bones, teeth falling out. They were being bombarded with radiation from the inside out, and it was killing them. These women were the first known and recorded cases of chronic radiation sickness, and their legal cases helped pave the way for a whole host of workers' rights many Americans enjoy today. Chernobyl's radiation impacts are a complicated mix of external exposure and ingested radioactivity. So to determine total deaths from things like cancers, we need to determine how people were exposed and how much they were exposed to. We then need to look at the incidence of cancers and other radiation-related illnesses, and then see if they can be linked to Chernobyl, and then see how many of those are fatal. Easy, right? Right. Wrong! For one, actually determining the scope of exposure is very difficult. Assessing the extent of Chernobyl radiation raises questions about who exactly you consider in any death count studies. The people sent in to clean up Chernobyl were given the colloquial name liquidators. According to the main parental or union distribution register used by the USSR, the number of liquidators is 293,100 people. The report from the Russian National Medical Dosimetric Registry, uh, I have since learned it is pronounced registry, quotes 168,000 liquidators in Russia, with 123,536 liquidators from Ukraine and 63,500 liquidators from Belarus, providing a total of around 355,000 people. But according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, just shy of 600,000 people were sent into the exclusion area based on the Soviet Union's all-union distribution registry. The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, kind of like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of Radiation Studies, put the number of liquidators at 500 126,250 across all countries between 1986 and 1991. Ukraine has an entirely independent registry that counts 651,453 people as liquidators. The number the International Atomic Energy Agency uses for Belarusian liquidators is 94,798, but the World Bank uses victim numbers established by Belarusian law, which puts the number of Belarusian liquidators at 107,810. The Belarusian Ministry of Health recorded 115,493 liquidators. And Chernobyl affected more than liquidators too. More than 5 million and people were living in areas classified by the Soviet authorities as contaminated, among them about 400,000 in the area of strict radiation control. Of the latter, about 116,000 living in the 30-kilometer exclusion zone were moved out of the area in 1986, and another 220,000 people were relocated in later years. So that's 600,000-ish liquidators on top of the 400,000-ish people in areas of strict radiation control and the 5 million in contaminated regions. UNSCIR analyzes liquidators, evacuees, residents of the contaminated areas within the three worst hit nations and the whole European continent and the kids of those affected. Hundreds of millions of people because all of these people would have been exposed to some level of radiation. Part of the reason for the large spread in data is considering who was actually exposed. Some studies take only the nearby countries into account, where smaller populations were exposed to higher doses of radiation. So the UN report concerned themselves with the three Soviet republics of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and they got a number between 5 and 9,000. Others expanded the effect into the whole of Europe, claiming that low doses can increase the likelihood of cancer. Put a pin in that. The Union of Concerned Scientists reasoned that since the impacts of Chernobyl affected the entire Northern Hemisphere, projections should consider all populations within the Northern Hemisphere exposed to Chernobyl radiation, which gets you the 27,000 number. But considering who's exposed is only part of the reason why there's so much spread in the data. There's also the nature of exposure. Here's a fun fact, my European heirs. Did you know your blueberries are radioactive? <laughs> well, okay, huge asterisk. Basically, the EU is hungry for berries. 
lots of berries. So much so that internal EU berry consumption outstrips supply, which means they have to import them. And a lot of these berry imports are fulfilled by Ukraine. Women in the Polsia region of Ukraine would pick blueberries from trees that grew in radioactive soil. Berries that were super radioactive weren't disposed of. They were put to one side and then mixed with cleaner berries until they averaged out at permissible levels. Then they could be sold for export. Which means that EU citizens could be eating blueberries contaminated with Chernobyl radiation. God, it makes you proud to be British. It's not just blueberries either. Due to the long-term nature of some forms of radiation, Chernobyl radiation is still detectable in much of the former Soviet Republic's agricultural supply chain and likely will be for many years. This is in part because Ukraine has fascinating soil. I'm allowed to say that. I studied geology for five years. I'm allowed to geek out about soil. <laughs> the northern regions of Ukraine are dominated by histosols, a peaty boggy soil, and podzoluvasols, a sandy loam type of soil. Chernobyl kicked up a lot of dust and radiation radioactive debris into the atmosphere. This dust created rain clouds which rained radioactive rain what, what? which rained radioactive black rain down across much of Europe. The nature of the soil meant radionuclides could easily diffuse into plants which grow in the soil. They get into the cows and sheep and their milk and meat enters the market. The soil in Ukraine still holds onto a lot of this residual radiation that continues to find its way into the food supply chains. Radioactive isotopes of cesium and strontium are still higher than pre-Chernobyl levels for the fish, meats, milk and vegetables for most of the affected region. Research into the riven communities of northern Ukraine found people were drinking milk that had radioisotope levels five times higher than recommended by the Ukrainian government. Exposure rates from diets and fabrics are also influenced by how individual governments responded to Chernobyl. Put a pin in that. In the UK, to stop potentially irradiated foods entering the supply chain, the British government ordered restrictions on the movement and sale of sheep within the most affected areas, particularly North Wales, Southwest Scotland, Northern Ireland, and the Lake District. In Wales, nearly 10,000 farmers and 4 million sheep were put under government restrictions, and 23 years later, restrictions were still in place. Any sheep that exceeded the monitoring pass mark, 1,000 becquerels per kilo, of radiocasium, Radiocesium, I meant radius, you get it, I can't pronounce things, were marked with apricot green or blue paint and couldn't be released from restrictions for three months. Those that passed the test were allowed to be sold and could enter the food supply chain. These restrictions had a paralyzing effect on farmers, their families, and their livelihoods. In comparison, Norway made the decision to increase the limit of cesium-137 concentrations in reindeer meat to 6,000 becquerels a kilo to avoid the collapse in the reindeer meat industry, put a pin in that. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Norwegian communities like the Sami, who eat a lot of reindeer meat, have higher doses of radioisotopes like cesium-137 in their bodies. Moscow provided its satellites with manuals on how its meat and dairy industry should handle radioactive foods, because food shortages were common common in the Soviet Union, and the Chernobyl disaster would have exacerbated those shortages if they had to dispose of all of the contaminated food stuff. Moscow instructed the industries of Belarus and Ukraine to cordon off highly irradiated foods to let their radiation levels fall, and mix medium and low-level exposed meats with clean meat to make sausages. This mixing brought the foodstuffs under the regulatory limits for radiation, and meant it was okay to enter the export market. The temporary permissible level within the Soviet bloc was significantly higher than spelled out in the Codex Alimentarius guideline level for radioisotopes in food, and significantly significantly higher than is permissible in US and EU markets. Later directives were issued in September 1986 that brought temporary contamination limits in line with the ones established by the European community shortly after the disaster. However, the Soviets struggled to prevent contaminated foods entering the supply chain. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster, state-run collectivized farms introduced countermeasures to reduce the amount of radiocesium in milk and produce. This was primarily achieved through clean feed, but countermeasure information was not issued to rural areas where milk was privately produced, which meant milk from private farms was allowed to enter to the food chain with radiocesium levels far higher than those allowed by the Soviet directives. These limits were maintained until the collapse of the Soviet Union before being reduced, and some affected nations were stricter than others, put a pin in that. Intuitively, you'd think that eating all of these radioactive foods would be a bad thing, but the evidence is a lot more mixed than you might realize. Foods like bananas naturally contain radioactive isotopes in them. You'll be exposed to more radiation eating a banana than living next to a nuclear plant for a year, and no one's ever died of radiation poisoning induced from a banana. Many crops that are grown in the exclusion Exclusion zone that are distilled into vodka, for example, have almost no detectable radiocesium in them. Like this bottle of atomic vodka I bought, made from poles grown in the exclusion zone. Buy your bottle of atomic vodka today from atomicvodka.com. This is how I end up in a Tom Nichols call out, isn't it? The Norwegian communities who rely on reindeer meats, despite having higher doses of cesium-137, don't have a higher incidence rates of things like cancers. Put a pin in that. Farmers in the UK have gotten into disputes with 
the Rural Payment Agency and Food Standards Agency about the UK's radionuclide limits. The FSA's official maximum limit for cesium-137 in meat is 1,000 becquerels per kilo. This limit echoes the internationally recognised standard established in the immediate aftermath of Chernobyl, but for extra precaution, the FSA works to a 600 becquerels per kilo limit. The Health Protection Agency has calculated that if someone were to eat 8 kilos of sheep meat a year, the average consumption in the UK, that contained the maximum limit of cesium-137, it would give the consumer a dose of 0.1 millisieverts. That's just one-tenth of a person's accepted annual limit. Increased radiation for most of the exposed populations is at levels comparable to natural background radiation. There's no clear observable evidence to date that this has increased the incidence of cancers, and given the low doses received by the majority of exposed individuals, any increase in cancer incidence or mortality will be difficult to detect in epidemiological studies. And we're not even entirely sure how much people might have been exposed to via these pathways anyway. The UNSCEAR report argues the amount of radiation people were exposed to may have been overestimated. And our concern goes beyond radiation. When people were evacuated from Fukushima, the stress of evacuation on the elderly led to deaths. Chernobyl would have likely caused a similar relocation trauma, potential PTSD, suicides by the displaced. Are there numbers on them? Can we even say their deaths were causally linked to Chernobyl if there were non-radiation deaths? And then we have to try and actually make causal links to illnesses from radiation exposure. The projections from the UN and Union of Concerned Scientists are based on the Linear No Threshold Model, or LNT, which assumes that there is no safe dose of radiation and even lower doses are dangerous. The bigger the dose, the higher the risk, and as the name says, there is a supposed no threshold below which radiation doesn't cause relevant effects. LNT underpins all legal regulations in radiation protection and is based on extrapolating backwards from observed data where there is a proportional relationship between exposure to radiation and risk, but as the exposure drops, so does the understanding of its impact. The main reasons for the acceptance of the LNT model are that it's simple, it fits data from several observational studies on radiation exposure and the development of cancer fairly well, and no alternative model has convincingly been shown to provide a better fit to these data. There are several competing ideas about the relationship between dose and radiation-induced cancers – linear, supralinear, threshold, and hormetic. These ones say people are more sensitive to risk from radiation exposure, this one argues there's a threshold limit before radiation becomes harmful, this one argues low-level doses can be beneficial to exposed populations. An overview of large epidemiological studies for the proceedings of the Royal Society looking at the estimates of excess relative risk of cancers from radiation exposure including nukes, work, environment, medical therapy, and radon all broadly support LNT. Zablotska looked at Chernobyl cleanup workers and found exposure to low doses and to low dose radiation was associated with an increase in risk for leukemia. Another study looking at heat, hey, hey, hang on. Hematological malignancies, cancers of the blood and bone marrow, found an increase in hematological malignancies in cleanup workers, as have two meta-analyses, one by Elizabeth Cardis, who looked at 196 leukemias and 5,024 other cancers among 400,000 nuclear workers in 15 countries with an average follow-up of 12.7 years, and another by Sarah Darby, looking at lung cancer risks connected with radon exposure with over 7,000 cases of lung cancer and 14,000 controls. Another study looking at nuclear plant workers suggested a linear increase in the rate of cancer with increasing radiation exposure. Although uncertainty exists in personal dose estimates, smoking and occupational asbestos exposure, excluding deaths from lung cancer and pleural cancer did not affect the association between cancer risk and occupational radiation exposure. Chernobyl liquidators also have higher incidences of cataracts, which led to the revision and considerable reduction in the recommended radiation dose limit for the lens of the eye. Lifespan studies of atomic weapon survivors is consistent with the linear dose response too, although there is some flattening of the dose response at higher doses. It's worth pointing out that these are relative risks, not absolute. Relative risk statistics tend to amplify the actual risk a person faces, and there's a host of literature that either disagrees with LNT or is inconclusive. For example, studies on the children of atomic bomb survivors couldn't find evidence to support what kind of dose response we see in in utero kids because the data were too sparse. In other analyses of atomic weapon studies, there seems to be a threshold at lower doses below which no harms can be observed. One study argues low radiation doses can actually trigger a variety of cellular defense mechanisms, and that there are minimal health risks with low radiation exposure, and that a dose higher than some threshold value is necessary to achieve the harmful effects classically observed with high doses of radiation. This was corroborated by a study conducted in Yanjiang, China, where background radiation is very high. They found mortality of all cancers in the high background radiation area was lower than in a control population, but not to statistical significance. Cardis's analysis of cancer incidents in nuclear power workers found data from the Canadian sites was the driving force behind the worldwide 
result, when Canadian workforces were excluded, they dropped back down to more permissible levels. Reanalysis of the Canadian data by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission found no increased cancer risks among Canadian nuclear power plant workers. Similar analyses by the International Atomic Energy Agency found no significant differences in health could be found between 853 inhabitants of contaminated areas and 803 inhabitants of controlled areas. Analysis of cancer mortality rates in residents of evacuated villages near Mayak nuclear weapons facility after an accident that released radioactivity into the environment found no relation between dosage and cancer at lower rates either. Incidences of bone sarcomas in radium dial painters suggests there is also a threshold at lower doses. Because of these huge uncertainties, it's virtually impossible to assess the ultimate death toll. To take from the abstract of Kenneth Mossman's paper, The LNT Debate in Radiation Protection, Science versus Policy, arguing the scientific merits of policy options is not likely to be fruitful because the science is not robust enough to support one theory to the exclusion of others. Current science cannot determine the existence of a dose threshold, a key piece to resolving this matter scientifically. The nature of the scientific evidence is such that risk assessments at small effective doses defined at less than 100 millisieverts is highly uncertain and several policy alternatives, including threshold and non-linear dose response functions, are scientifically defensible. This paper argues for an alternative approach by looking at the LNT debate as a policy question and analyzes the problem from a social and economic perspective. In other words, risk assessment and a strictly scientific perspective are insufficiently broad enough to resolve the issue completely. Put a pin in that. No, don't type out, put a pin in that. I mean, we'll be revisiting this later. No, don't type this out either. Which is why the UNSCIR report said, the present understanding of the late effects of protracted exposure to ionizing radiation is limited, since the dose response assessments rely heavily on studies of exposures to high doses and animal experiments. Studies of the Chernobyl accident exposure might shed light on the late effects of protracted exposure, but given the low doses received by the the majority of exposed individuals, any increase in cancer incidence or mortality will be difficult to detect in epidemiological studies. Unske went on to clarify, the committee has decided not to use models to project absolute numbers of effects in populations exposed to low radiation doses from the Chernobyl accident because of unacceptable certainties in predictions. Effectively, they weren't going to try and figure out a definitive death toll, realizing the whole thing was a thankless task that wouldn't, couldn't, give a solid answer. But thankless task is my middle name. So, it's, it's not, my actual middle name is Tom. Until Chernobyl survivors, children and grandchildren grow up, the only way to assess long-term radiation effects is to look for DNA mutations. But again, this is highly uncertain. Yuri Dubrova, a geneticist at the University of Leicester, found increased genetic changes in the children of irradiated parents, but the fingerprinting technique he used only allowed him to look at non-coding regions, known as junk DNA. One study in the Journal of Pediatrics found that children in Polissa, the region representing the northern half of the Riven province, or Oblast in Ukraine, had the highest rates of neural tube defects in Europe. 22 of 10,000 babies born in the region had a neural tube defect, compared with the European average of 9 per 10,000 babies. However, the largest and most recent recent study into the area looked at 130 children born to liquidators and, thankfully, found no evidence children born to Chernobyl survivors carried more genetic mutations than non-exposed children. Turning to studies of animals living in the Chernobyl exclusion zone doesn't illuminate things either. The Chernobyl exclusion zone supports an abundant community after nearly three decades of chronic radiation exposure, and they don't seem to be bothered by all that excess radiation. Barn swallows that breed in Chernobyl have higher rates of birth defects, but tree swallows seem okay with high levels of radiation. Plant trees saw stunted growth immediately after, but they've since recovered, unlike bees whose population have crashed at present levels of radiation in the area. Whether human studies will be more like these than bees will be determined by the final major issue around determining Chernobyl's death toll. Time. What we learned from our studies on atom bomb victims and from documented cases of radium poisoning is that there is a lag between exposure to radiation and illnesses emerging, and sometimes that lag is several decades long. Apart from the large increase in thyroid cancer incidences in young people, there are, I'll say again, no clearly demonstrated radiation-related increases in cancer risks. For many, many people, their radiation doses were so low, it might be impossible to tease out carcinogenic effects from other risk factors such as smoking or diet. But the fact that no other radiation-related health effect has yet been clearly demonstrated does not mean that no increase has occurred or will occur in the future. When these studies say we can't clearly demonstrate it, they're not saying it didn't happen, they're saying we can't clearly demonstrate it. There are too few studies to make solid conclusions, and most of the studies aren't actually able to because of limitations in their methodologies. That means that if there are long-term impacts as a result of Chernobyl, it's too early to make a call one way or the other. So, just so we're all keeping tabs, we're trying to figure out the death toll of a disaster, 
where the victims were exposed to highly variable amounts of radiation through a million different vectors, where the cancers and illnesses can take decades to become noticeable, and where weeding out cancer cases triggered by Chernobyl can't be done with statistical confidence using a projection model whose validity is highly contested based on a mishmash of measurements and responses where there isn't even agreement on who you would count in such a study. How do you go about disentangling all of this? I wish I knew, because no one seems interested in trying, because politics ruins everything. The confusion around the Chernobyl accident arises largely because of an absence of comprehensive and coordinated efforts to delineate the overall physical and mental health consequences of the accident. Since radiation-related diseases could occur decades after exposure, if you want to fully assess the half-life of radiological illnesses, you kind of need to commit to continued studies and monitoring. So it might sound completely crazy slash unbelievable slash batshit to learn that despite Chernobyl being a cataclysmic accident which led to the fallout that affected nearly all of Europe, there isn't a comprehensive ongoing European study into the impacts in the same way you had for the atomic bomb. Instead, we've gotten a mishmash of studies, some more extensive than others. There's no standardization with regards to monitoring long-term impacts for people affected. I realize, again, that sounds batshit, but there isn't a uniform Chernobyl registry looking at long-term impacts and taking tissue samples from those affected. There was no continuity, and no overarching panel looking at how science should be done. The Soviets established an upper radiation dose limit five times higher than what the Americans deemed acceptable, and that was it. Because of the inconsistencies of state responses, people didn't know what their own doses were, or how at risk they were to different effects. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, countries with evacuees and liquidators created their own cohorts, their own monitoring systems, and their own tissue sample banks, all of varying quality and scope. Epidemiological studies have been hampered in Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus by a lack of funds and bad scientific infrastructure. Research has been piecemeal, and the data collected varies by robustness in data collection and methods. So, if we mix the Soviet Union's collapse, scarce funding, imprecise dissymmetry, difficulties tracking people over the years, wildly different approaches to establishing cohorts, monitors, and tissue banks in the post-Soviet era, and a mere approach to collecting data, we get a limited number of studies of questionable reliability. Delicious. And because a lot of the people who were responsible for cleaning up Chernobyl are now dying, we're at risk of what one study called irretrievable data loss. The International Agency for Research on Cancer and the Cooperation on Chernobyl Health Research, or COCHA, put out a joint report in 2016 that set out a plan to establish a uniform registry and set up long-term studies into the impacts, something akin to a lifespan study. But has any of that happened? Has it fucked? Nobody has come forward to organize or provide the funding necessary to get solid numbers on the subject, which means that COCHA is going nowhere. But it goes one level deeper than that. Chernobyl provides direct evidence of the consequences of a major nuclear accident, and the affected populations deserve a comprehensive investigation of the accident-related health effects. And it's not the uncertainty around the research denying them that. Here's where I diverge from Kurt Kazak. Most conversations around Chernobyl usually use a scientific or technical lens to analyze it. When we ask why the reactor exploded, we usually analyze the question from an engineering lens rather than a political one. Did I put a pin in that? Yes, put a pin in that. Discussions around Chernobyl, its death tolls, and its wider environmental consequences try to do the same thing. Use a scientific and technical lens to make sense of the disaster. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. These perspectives are often informative, but that sort of lens will always be limited because of the mass uncertainty around Chernobyl, there are a lot of positions which are scientifically defensible. As Philosophy Tube in her video on Chernobyl and personal responsibility astutely put it, if the wider scientific community have said the death toll is to some degree unknowable, then all we have left are the stories that we tell. Suffering is no longer suffering when it finds a meaning, and people need Chernobyl to mean something. This isn't a thing a lot of people, particularly the yay science crowd, give serious consideration to. I don't know if you've spent a great deal of time on Science Tube, but nuclear energy is, uh, polarizing. And it's not helped by the fact that half of Science Tube watches are this picture. Tries to compare to this small comment section. The yay science crowd want to believe in the existence of a clean gap between science and politics, one that has never existed and will never be possible. They want to believe that science is the best, only way to determine truth in the world. 
Now, the postmodernists are wrong to say science isn't a path to objective truth, but in another, more correct way, they're right. Science is shaped around political lines of power. As an example, science continues to privilege the research and opinions of those who live in West Europe and the North Americas, as opposed to studies and research of scientists who live in the East or Global South. This is seen in everything from citation rates to funding. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that we turn to science to analyze Chernobyl because we want certainty. And because that certainty doesn't exist, we force it to exist. Because there is a need to make this poignant experience fit into a wider story that makes sense. Which means we're shaping the science around the existing prejudices and interests of groups with power. Science is not immune from those who wish to use science as a cover or justification for furthering their own prejudices and interests. The nuances of evidence are, to a large degree, irrelevant to people when asked to make judgment calls about whether to believe something. When you argue about Chernobyl, you are, to an extent, picking which story to believe. The failure of science and scientists to properly grasp the nettle of these prejudices and undue influences has allowed ideologues to fill the vacuum created by uncertainty. And ideologues aren't interested in the truth. They want to fight a proxy war. This is not a story of technology run amok, although that's how many people would understand it to be. The history of nuclear power is a history of, of political and economic and social decisions being made about a technology. And the, the key decisions weren't made by the technologists. They were done in the business realm. What science and technology gives you is a range of possibilities. And those possibilities can take you in any number of directions. It's potentially a liberating force but to get there, society has to stop sleepwalking and start realizing that it's, it's not a scientific choice, it's not an engineering choice, it's a moral choice. Nuclear power isn't just nuclear power. It has political symbology. And that political symbology has taken on many forms. Sometimes it's governments clumsily trying their best to determine the best path forward, which ultimately end up cutting across pre-existing socio-political lines. In the absence of information after Chernobyl, the Norwegian government raised reindeer meat limits to 6,000 becquerels a kilo and kept the limit of other foodstuffs at 600 becquerels a kilo. The Norwegian state maintained that this would aid the reindeer industry because meat could be legally sold with higher becquerel levels and that it wouldn't affect many Norwegians because some considered reindeer meat to be a luxury item. In some ways, the becquerel limit made little difference. In the autumn of 1986, becquerel levels of meat in some southern regions measured as high as 40,000 becquerels a kilo. And in 1998, over 500 metric tons of reindeer had to be slaughtered due to high becquerel levels. The Norwegian government sponsored programs to help reduce radioactivity levels of reindeer prior to the autumn slaughter. One such program involved the importing of safe lichen from other areas, which lowered the meat's becquerel levels and allowed more meat to enter the market. The government also agreed to compensation for trucking reindeer to safer pastures if the meat proved to be marketable, and compensation for animals not fit for market. At the same time, expert statements ranged from claims of minimal health risks to the prediction of hundreds of cancer deaths. The Sami had to question state reports of high radiation counts and demands to restructure herding practices, which were contradicted with likewise convincing claims that radiation levels were insignificant and posed virtually no health risks to them and future generations. No Sami family in the modern Scandinavian welfare state fears starvation as a result of Chernobyl contamination of its herds, but past and present threats to Sami culture as a result of Chernobyl are serious and far-reaching, even if they're hard to untangle. Chernobyl opened a rift in Sami communities. Many northern Sami tend to play down the seriousness of Chernobyl contamination, suggesting that the dramatic story of radioactivity threats to Sami culture have been irresponsibly overplayed by the media. In contrast, many southern Sami express anger at what they see as neglect of the plight of Sami in very contaminated areas. South Sami in the worst contaminated central regions represent a minority within a Sami minority. Their small numbers and distinctive Sami dialect place them in a vulnerable position even before the Chernobyl disaster. Over 50% of South Sami are directly involved in reindeer herding, practiced on a much smaller scale and in a less mechanized way than the more extensive and commercialized reindeer ranching of the north. Some express fears that their distinctive South Sami way of life may be seen by others as expendable. From the uses of the deer carcasses to changes in herding practices, little by little, herders that remain in business have forfeited customs and beliefs. They go through the motions only to have their reindeer purchased through subsidies as contaminated meat and then destroyed. One of the worst things is pretending. We know that the work of our hands just ends in animals being thrown into the ground. 
But the only ways we know how to handle the deer are the careful ways our fathers taught us and that we hope to teach our children. So we pretend and we hope. What else can we do? This is the life I know. Reindeer herding is not a job, but a way of living. It involves the whole family and the learning begins very early, often before the age of seven. It's a traditional based learning. Learning through participation and own experiences is the only way you can become a reindeer herder. After the Chernobyl accident, the people got anxious and distressed. Not having control over the situation and not having any knowledge about nuclear disasters was something greatly concerned the Sami people. Suddenly we had to trust that the information we received was correct. Governmental help to manage the new situation was not only necessary, but also fundamental. New solutions were enforced that was not based on traditional knowledge and past experience. We have to fence and feed the animals instead of using the natural pasture. Suddenly the slaughter had to be scheduled after the level of radioactive waste in the reindeer, so we were no longer allowed to slaughter the animals in winter time when the calves were largest and the quality of meat was the best. The food that was located out in the wild was no longer available. The traditional summer diets of freshwater fish, berries and mushrooms was no longer recommended. This is our earth and the ground that gives us the food. This is not just a matter of economics, but who we are, how we live, how we are connected to our deer and each other. Now we must buy everything. Thread, material, food, shoes are all now different things when they used to be part of one thing. This is what I mean when I say nuclear power has political symbology. For the Sami, a group which has and still faces long-lasting discrimination at the hands of Swedish and Norwegian governments, questions about how safe their food is post-Chernobyl are really questions about the right for their culture, language and identity to even exist. But we don't have those conversations. The conversations we have around nuclear energy are the ones that reflect the perspectives, prejudices and interests of dominant groups. This political symbology has other shapes, be it as the talisman of modernity, or national independence, or nationalism, or a scapegoat to avoid talking about the failures of free market economics, or the struggle for democracy, or in the case of Ukraine, all of the above. Here's a timeline of events to help illustrate what I mean. Chernobyl explodes on the 26th of April 1986. Sweden detects increased radiation from the USSR on the 28th. Hey, what's going on over there? Oh, that, oh, it's fine, don't worry about it. German and Italian media report on the Chernobyl accident on the 29th of April. France says nothing. The Soviets put out another broadcast. No guys, seriously, it's fine. Two people are dead, not 2,000, stop asking. The next day, France reports on Chernobyl. Est-ce qu'on a constaté quelque chose au-dessus de la France? Non, parce que les vents ne vont pas dans cette direction. Là, les vents tournent dans le sens inverse des lignes du monde. Il n'y a pas lieu du tout de s'inquiéter. C'est sans aucun danger. Germany and Italy detect increased radiation levels within their borders. On the 1st of May, the French government refuses to release information to the public about Chernobyl fallout, instead saying they detected a negligible increase in radiation. Germany's ruling Social Democratic Party goes from pro to anti-nuclear almost overnight, while German Greens declare that Chernobyl is everywhere. The next day, Germany places restrictions on milk being sold if contaminated with more than 500 becquerels per litre of iodine-131. Italy prohibits the sale of leafy vegetables and milk to children. Britain detects the radiation plume and black rain falls over the north of Wales and Lancashire. In the east, Moscow pushes for a May Day parade to celebrate International Workers' Day, even as radiation levels in Kiev spike. By the 4th of May, Germany had brought in limits on radioisotopes found in fresh vegetables, while anti-nuclear demonstrations broke out across the country. French media reports increased radiation in their neighbours, but says that the measures Germany has brought in are alarmist. Just one day later, France sets contamination limits on iodine-131 in milk at 3,700 becquerels per litre. On the 6th of May, the EC releases a declaration saying that member states should set maximum levels of iodine-131 in milk at 500 becquerels a litre forcing the French to do the same. The French Minister of Agriculture declares border controls on foodstuffs aren't justified, while Italian Greece propose a referendum on nuclear power. Anti-nuclear demonstrations in Germany continue. The next day, the European community bans imports of meat from Eastern European countries, and Germany's federal government gets into a fight with its state about how much radiation is too much. On the 9th, France finally adopts the EC restrictions on Eastern European food imports. The next day, a 150,000 strong protest against nuclear power breaks out in Rome. French nuclear Nuclear authorities show contamination maps in French news that indicate that radiation from Chernobyl fallout has pushed French radiation levels 400 times higher than background. France, radiation levels 400 times background level is by no means a negligible increase. Huh. On the 13th of May, France bans the sale of spinach from the Alsace region, but just spinach and just from Alsace. To the east, May 14th, Gorbachev finally talks publicly about the accident. She was nice, yeah. 
авария на Чобольской атомной электростанции. Она больно затронула советских людей, взволновала международную общественность. Мы, мы впервые реально столкнулись с такой грозной силой, какой является ядерная энергия, вышедшая из-под контроля. Then, on the 20th of May, a nuclear accident occurs at the La Hague reprocessing plant in France. Five workers suffer radiation sickness, and green groups begin openly questioning the safety of French nuclear plants. By the 30th of May, the EC sets upper limits of radioisotopes on fresh produce and lifts import bans from Eastern Europe. The nuclear lobby, which was a powerful group in both France and Germany at the time, tries to regain control of the narrative. The French Radiation Safety Board held a full monopoly on data in France. Non-governmental experts had no access to data, and even other governmental authorities that collected data couldn't question the Radiation Safety Board's decision on whether to take action. This prevented anti-nuclear Greens in France from effectively organizing. In Germany, the emphasis on decentralization and local democracy meant information was easy for non-governmental actors to get, and the anti-nuclear movement held the initiative. On the 4th of June, Germany set up the Ministry for the Environment and Nuclear Safety. This would begin its journey to the Energy Vinda, which would aim for a total phase-out of its nuclear power stations. By the 20th of June, a full six weeks after black rain fell over the north of England and Wales, the UK government bars the sale of sheep from a total of 9,000 farms. In the East, the anti-nuclear movement was slower to mobilize, but based on partially declassified documents from the CIA, one did successfully start to emerge thanks to glasnost, which roughly translates to openness. Citizen pressure within the Soviet bloc led to the suspension of 10 nuclear power plants. Initially, as Roman Sporluck points out, Chernobyl was ideologically neutral. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union could have treated it as a Soviet tragedy and used it as a rallying point for the solidarity of all Soviet citizens. This didn't happen. Instead, reporting by dissidents revealed the KGB took the decision to obfuscate the extent of the disaster. In September 1988, the liberal Moscow journal Novimir released documents from Alz Adamovich. Adamovich revealed post-mortem data on people in affected areas of Belarus who had lungs filled with radioactive particles. Lead KGB files show that medical doctors were forbidden from living in the city of Bragin due to unacceptable levels of radiation. Journalist Aya Yarashinskia spoke to those living in the Naradichi district. She learned from local medical personnel that 80% of the children in the region had enlarged thyroid glands, a sign of abnormally high levels of radiation exposure. Before the Chernobyl disaster, only 10% of children had such symptoms. She also reported workers at construction sites complaining of headaches and fatigue. Yuri Valonyeshtov of the Belarusian Academy of Sciences showed Yaroshinskia documented increases in anemia, hypertension, and hyperplasia of the thyroid. She circulated her findings through unofficial channels. These documents would later be used by the Ukrainian and other pro-democracy movements to further the case for independence from the Soviets. In January of 1988, the Ukrainian State Committee for the Utilization of Atomic Energy was in full rebellion against the USSR Council of Ministers, rejecting the expansion of three existing nuclear plants in the region. They claimed that the bitter lessons of Chernobyl had no impact on Moscow's bureaucracy and slated the Council of Ministers' militant position and attempts to impose its decisions again and again in opposition to public opinion and without consultation with Republic experts. Chernobyl played no small part in accelerating Glasnost, which had remained largely rhetorical in early 1986, and forced Gorbachev to introduce more pro-democracy reforms. The anti-nuclear movement within the Soviet Union would eventually metastasize with movements for independence and the fight for democracy. Chernobyl was no longer ideologically neutral, inspiring what, in the end, would grow into to a popular national movement. The Ukrainian intelligentsia saw Chernobyl as a Ukrainian issue, not in a narrow ethnic sense, but as a tragedy for Ukraine and all of its people. One of the first calls for the formation of a mass public organization to promote greater independence from Moscow that reached a wide audience was made by the poet Dmitryo Pavliko at an ecological meeting in Kiev organized by several informal groups on November 13, 1988. This would become the popular movement of Ukraine for perestroika, or Ruch. On the 9th of April 1989, the first semi-three elections in the Soviet Union since 1917 took place, and 300 of the 2,250 seats in the Soviet mega-parliament went to people with some affiliation with green or anti-nuclear movements. Yaroshinskia was elected to the Congress of People's Deputies and used the opportunity to speak openly about Chernobyl. The party boss of Belarus, Yefrem Sokolov, also used the Congress platform to talk about the ways Chernobyl had rendered parts of Belarus near uninhabitable. With the liberalization of the press, the veil of secrecy around Chernobyl was being lifted. 
and with that came protests. Full-scale protests of 30,000 people broke out in Ukraine on September 30th, 1989. There were further mass anti-nuclear demonstrations by the Belarusian Popular Front and Ukrainian Ruk. In October of 1989, leaked documents dated from the 29th of February 1988 specifying what sort of information should be made available to the media were released by Moscow News. They showed that despite radiation spikes over Kiev four days after the accident, people were encouraged to go to May Day celebrations anyway. In the 1990 Ukrainian Supreme Soviet election, the anti-nuclear slash pro-democracy movement gained 111 of the 442 seats in the Rada. Members of the parliament of what was still the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic took the independent step of proposing a set of laws on state protection and compensation for all workers in the zone. The Soviet finance ministry withdrew the funds necessary for containment, payment and monitoring of the zone workers, further cementing the idea that the only way for Ukraine to safeguard itself from a repeat of the disaster was independence from Moscow. While Chernobyl had become the catalyst for eco-nationalism in Ukraine, resentment in the Ukrainian Communist Party against Moscow had begun soon after the Chernobyl nuclear catastrophe too. The power station was entirely under Moscow's control, but it was the Ukrainian authorities who were left to deal with the long-term consequences of the disaster and take care of those resettled from contaminated regions. It was exacerbated by the encouragement of democratic movements in the Republic by Glasnost, which allowed for mass protest movements against the authorities sparked by Chernobyl. The Ukrainian elite felt betrayed, abandoned, and angry. By July 1990, 92 communists had broken away from the party bloc to become independents. The remaining communists reorganized themselves into a new majority bloc they called for a Soviet sovereign Ukraine, also known as the Group of 239. When Leonid Kravchuk became speaker, he presided over a parliament where one half was pro-independence, the other half were pro-greater autonomy in the USSR and mounting protest movements. In order to prove that he was not just a political chameleon, Kravchuk allowed a draft declaration of independence to be read on August 24th. 346 Ukrainian deputies voted in favor of independence. Ukraine became the first country with a communist-dominated legislature to make such a declaration. The next day, Belarus followed suit, followed by Moldova, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. When in December of 1991, Ukraine voted 90% in favor of independence, the writing was on the wall for the USSR, and it dissolved just a few weeks later. I hope this timeline helps show what I mean. Nuclear power isn't just nuclear power. For some, nuclear means nationalism. For others, it's a talisman of modernity. For Ukraine, this modernity came at the cost of losing their Ukrainian heritage, and it was thought to be a price worth paying. Mazarenko, one of Ukraine's top scientists, points to nuclear energy as an alternative to the destruction of nature caused by traditional industries, lauding the Chernobyl station as a model of the future. Oleksandr Levada, a leading light of Ukrainian intelligentsia, wrote a play called Hello Pripyat, promoting nuclear energy as the cleanest source of electricity, asserting its compatibility with environmental protection. Any notion that nuclear power might pose a threat to people or the environment is dismissed. Those expressing such concerns in the play Hello Pripyat are negative characters, either wartime collaborators with the Nazis or backwards-looking peasant women. Yavorysky was an early proponent of nuclear power in Ukraine. He'd published a novel, Chain Reaction, in 1978 that celebrated the construction of the Chernobyl power plant as the triumph of communist modernity. After Chernobyl, though, nuclear power in Ukraine became a symbol of imperialist oppression. Yavorivsky began his evolution from nuclear enthusiast to anti-nuclear crusaders soon after the catastrophe. He would go on to become the principal organizer of the first Congress of Ruk. Now, it's worth pointing out that the pro-democracy movement in the Ukraine and Belarus wasn't entirely anti-nuclear. It was a coalition of groups, some pro-nuclear, others not. But Chernobyl was a lightning rod that united all of them in their struggle for liberation against those who would see their cultures and ways of life eradicated. After Chernobyl, an open letter in the Literatura Ukraina from the Ukrainian Union of Writers opposed the construction of a nuclear plant in Chigirin, not on safety grounds, but historical ones. Chigirin was the capital of an independent Ukraine. When the USSR collapsed, the symbol of Chernobyl changed again, it became a symbol of nation building, the lightning rod needed to create a sense of solidarity among the Ukrainian people. Ukraine set up one of the most generous social welfare programs in history to deal with the aftermath of the catastrophe. Ukrainian lawmakers lowered the Soviet threshold dose from 35 rem to 7 rem, comparable to what an average American would be exposed to in their lifetime. They revised Soviet-made maps of radioactive fallout based on lowered threshold doses, which massively expanded the areas of contamination and brought hundreds of thousands of people into Ukraine's social welfare system as Chernobyl sufferers. By the mid-1990s, 5% of the Ukrainian budget was allocated to fund projects dealing with 
with the consequences of the Chernobyl accident, and 65% of social welfare resources were devoted to assisting the now 3.3 million citizens categorized as sufferers. In 1991, Belarus spent 22.3% of its budget on Chernobyl aid. But Ukraine and Belarus lack commodities like oil and gas, and the post-Soviet economy of the region collapsed in its transition to a free market. To deal with its expenditures, Ukrainian legislators introduced a Chernobyl tax of 12% on corporate income. But it wasn't enough. The state, faced with too many people claiming to have been affected by Chernobyl, conceded that it could not afford to compensate everyone, even if they were sick. Hang on, we have all these nuclear power stations, why can't we just sell the power they make to the region? That makes sense, actually. So, Ukraine turned back to nuclear energy as a way to fund their social programs and rebuild their economy. And here's where Ukraine goes from one kind of imperial oppression to another. When the news of Chernobyl restarting reached the directors of nuclear power companies in the West, they panicked. Another accident in the East could damage the reputation of nuclear power in the West beyond repair and put them out of business. Ukraine could not, under any circumstances, switch its reactors back on. Western companies lobbied their governments to launch a program for upgrading Eastern European reactors using Western technology and money. The G7 pushed Ukraine to accelerate the closure of its nuclear plants. The Ukrainian government argued they couldn't just turn off a power plant that produced 6% of the country's electricity while its economy was in freefall. The EU didn't care. They withheld $85 million in economic assistance to Ukraine unless progress was made on the closure of the Chernobyl power plant. Ukraine tried to get the money for a gas fire plant to replace Chernobyl, which was opposed by Western creditors. Chernobyl wasn't going to be replaced by natural gas. It was going to be replaced by a nuclear reactor, designed by Western companies. The message was clear. Ukraine would only get money for projects approved by Western institutions, built by Western contractors. In desperation, Ukraine turned to Russia for assistance. This alarmed Western nuclear industries who believed Chernobyl would operate indefinitely and they would be denied the contracts they felt they were owed. Anti-nuclear groups adopted the position to oppose the construction of new reactors using Western designs. Everyone disliked that. To many, green movements were okay with the idea of Ukraine's economy collapsing and its people suffering and risking another Chernobyl if it meant they could use Chernobyl for their own political goals of a nuclear power phase-out in the West. To others, groups like Greenpeace were seen as a Trojan horse for the interests of oil conglomerates. American oil and gas companies under the Nixon administration used the oil crises of the 70s to inflate their own profits. To prevent suppliers switching to cheaper nuclear energy, they used the environmental movement to lobby government and force nuclear power generation to take account of the risks of accidents and the costs of disposing of spent fuel, making nuclear less affordable and thus less likely to become a lower-priced alternative to fossil fuels. Suspicion about green groups and their ulterior motives is alive and well today. The Yablokov book from earlier that claimed nearly one million deaths wasn't peer-reviewed. Several very harsh critiques of it have appeared in the New York Academies of Sciences blog, including my favorite ever sentence to appear in an academic opinion paper, the value of consequences is not zero, but negative. According to Rod Adams from Atomic Insights, a pro-nuclear blog, Yablokov's book was published with funding from Lem Blavatnik of Access Industries, which obtained the rights to Russian oil and gas reserves worth $6.15 billion. Editor Soup here. So my legal consultants say that the implication being made there is potentially litigious. So if you're watching this, Len, um, I'm not making those implications. Rod is. Sue him. It should also be noted, the kinds of anti-nuclear sentiments that emerge and take root arise in part thanks to the cloak and dagger ways the nuclear sector operates. The nuclear sector doesn't have clean hands here. First and foremost, they were concerned with damage control. The reason France and Germany went down two very different paths following Chernobyl had little to do with any scientific analysis of facts and far more to do with the ways the French political system controlled information to stop any sort of democratic opposition to nuclear energy from forming. Prior to Chernobyl, the world's worst nuclear disaster occurred in 1957 at the Mayak facility. It's known as the Kishtim disaster. Through sheer luck, from the Politburo's perspective, winds carried the fallout internally into the USSR, which allowed them to conceal it. Except, not quite. The Americans at this point were extensively spying on the USSR via U-2 planes. They knew about the disaster, and they said nothing. They were concerned that knowledge of the disaster would dissuade Americans from nuclear energy programs. 
This feeling of looking out for the industry first has plagued bodies like the International Atomic Energy Agency as well. Uncertainty around Chernobyl's death toll has plagued the official body since 1986 for the reasons that we've already outlined. The head of the Soviet delegation, Valery Legazov, told the IAEA that based on Soviet measurements of external radiation exposure, iodine-131 ingestion, and preliminary speculative calculations of cesium-137 contamination of food, total excess cancer deaths could reach around 50,000. Morris Rosen, the IAEA's then nuclear safety director, estimated 25,000 excess cancers and 10,000 additional cancer deaths, whereas the then chairman of the International Commission on Radiological Protection argued excess deaths could be as low as 5,100. The 4,000 number from the UN's Chernobyl Forum was chosen by a press officer as a counterbalance to what they saw as anti-nuclear propaganda, and it continues to be presented with a certainty that simply isn't warranted. In fact, several of the very scientists, physicians, and biomedical consortia whose work the joint group had cited alleged publicly that the joint group had either misrepresented their work or interpreted it out of context. And while all this bickering about numbers was, and still is, going back and forth, we seem to forget the most important part of why we were trying to find that out in the first place. The community. First up tonight is a look at the worst oil spill in this nation's history. It took place on Friday when a super tanker owned by the Exxon Corporation hit a reef 25 miles off the port of Valdez. By today, 10 million gallons of oil covered 100 square miles of ocean. In 1989, one of the worst oil spills ever recorded occurred near Cordova off the coast of Alaska. An Exxon tanker collided with a shallow reef and ruptured, spilling crude oil across 1,900 miles of coastline. The spill was a result of a multitude of fail-safes failing. The ship drifted off shipping route, the captain wasn't supervised, the crew were overworked, collision radar systems weren't maintained, and Exxon management knew it. They knew all of it. But pressure to turn profit meant crews stayed overworked, and collision systems that were too expensive to fix stayed broken. On top of that, no one knew how to clean up a spill of Cordova's scale. No one knew what to do or how to respond. So oil kept spilling into the coastal waters of Alaska. Fishing boats were stuck in docks. Businesses went broke. Hundreds of thousands of animals died as a result. The community of Cordova bore the brunt of the Exxon spill. Naturally, this led to a class action lawsuit consisting of almost 33,000 plaintiffs, everyone from local government to business owners, fishermen, deckhands, cannery workers, and Alaska native corporations. A third of Cordovan households were involved in the litigation. An Anchorage jury ruled that Exxon be forced to pay $287 million in damages and $5 billion punitive, a year's profits. Appealing this decision all the way to the Supreme Court, Exxon got this reduced to $500 million total. But while all this high legal drama was unfolding, no one was talking about the forgotten communities in Alaska. Cordova saw a near total collapse in community cohesion. Among the indigenous population, the oil spill severed spiritual ties to the environment. For many, the connection to the land and the sense of place and feeling safe it brought was ruined. It's a loss of a way of life. It's hard for people to understand that. They think that we have a choice between uh, the foods that we gather and prepare or going to the store. That isn't so. If you take that away, they can never go out and buy what they've lost. Friends, families, and neighbors turned on each other. Crime skyrocketed, as had divorce rates and domestic violence. Chronic health issues as a result of the spill rose. Drug use and alcoholism spiked, as did rates of depression, anxiety, PTSD, and suicide. Cleanup workers 20 years on from the disaster claim they have been slowly poisoned by the exposure to oil and cleanup chemicals used to control the spill. They call their illnesses Exxon Crud. Exxon steadfastly denies all of this. In a statement issued to CNN, Exxon said it could not confirm the number of people who had developed chronic illness as a result of the cleanup. Of the roughly 50,000 workers hired for the effort, there were no adverse judgments rendered against the company. After 20 years, there is no evidence suggesting that either cleanup workers or the residents of the communities affected by the Valdez spill have had any adverse health effects as a result of the spill or its cleanup. Exxon also refused to compensate for the pollution they caused and made compensation for lost businesses caused by the spill contingent on whether it could be directly proven the spill caused it. What, what have you lost at this point that I can compensate you for other than the fact we've had to have this meeting and the fact that you've had to see your beautiful Prince William Sound besmirched with crud? 
I'm sorry about that, but that is not at this day and time compensable. But if your nets don't fill up, that we can take care of. If you can show that your motel goes out of business, that we can take care of. This ambiguity of harm creates the conditions where communities feel helpless, angry, and betrayed. The trust that bound the community together was broken, and it never came back. Cordova and Chernobyl share a lot of the same story, a human-caused environmental catastrophe created by a series of compounding systemic factors exacerbated by uncertain and confused responses, ending with a collapse in faith in the powers that be as they gaslight the victims traumatized by the disaster. In the book Voices from Chernobyl, The Oral History of a Nuclear Disaster, Svetlana Alexeyevich collects the oral testimonies of the communities hit by Chernobyl. Okay, uh, editor soup here. So Alexeyevich is a Belarusian oral historian widely seen as a writer who gives a voice to the people who experienced some of the most violent and historically significant events of the 20th century. Her bread and butter is to let the witness speak, and this is very apparent in the structural emphasis on the multi-voice nature of the material presented in her books. Alexeyevich often emphasizes the importance of a plurality of truths in her work. It doesn't look at written records, but focuses on memory. I'm not going to bury the lead here. Her book, Voices from Chernobyl, or Chernobyl Prayer, depending on your translation, draws criticisms from certain groups. These range from those who I'll call CGP Greyites, dismissive of oral history as hearsay and therefore not a valid kind of history, to the much more valid viewpoint that the way information is presented reveals the distinct biases of Alexeyevich. Now, there is no evidence whatsoever to suggest Alexeyevich altered testimonies, but there is validity to the critique that she met a lot of real people, interviewed them, and then carefully selected several voices, allowing her to tell her own emotional story. Across Alexeyevich's wheelhouse, her oral histories define themselves against the mythologizing propagated by the Soviet authorities. For Alexeyevich, the understanding of Chernobyl is symbolic of the failures of Soviet utopian visions and forms part of a wider emphasis which amounts to a harsh criticism of the Soviet system. It's a stained glass view of the event, and I will do my best to acknowledge that stained glass view of the event and correct for it where I can. I'll fail, because I'm a human with my own biases. But I want to address why I disagree with the CGP Greyites when they dismiss oral histories. Every record of the past is incomplete, and our personal experiences inevitably shape our understanding of what happened before us. So to those of you who dismiss Alexeyevich because you want unbiased facts, you're implicitly applying your own biases to the events when determining who gets to be a voice. As John Green very elegantly puts it, the opportunity of studying history is the opportunity to experience empathy. Studying history and making genuine attempts at empathy helps us to grapple with the complexity of the world, not as we wish it were, but as we find it. The testimonies in Chernobyl Prayer are a reflection of the stories the survivors choose to tell, like the stories we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. The story of Chernobyl is, first and foremost, one that aims to capture the muddled meanings of an event that demands meaning, and the perspectives of the survivors, tainted with their own biases, misrememberings, bitterness or nostalgias, are an integral part in giving Chernobyl meaning. So I've chosen to include them here. So, let's all put on our sensitive hats, and we'll begin. From the very beginning, I felt that we were Chernobylites, that we were already a separate people. Our bus stopped overnight in a village. Um, some people slept on the floor in a school, others in a club. There was nowhere to go. One woman invited us to sleep at her house. Come, she said, I'll put down some linen for you. I feel bad for your boy. And her friend started dragging her away from us. Are you crazy? They're contaminated. When we settled, in Mogilev, and our son started school. He came back the very first day in tears. They put him next to a girl who said that she didn't want to sit with him, that he was radioactive. Our son was in the fourth grade, and he was the only one from Chernobyl in the class, and the other kids were afraid of him. They called him Shiny. His childhood had ended so early. Everyone is used to the words, Chernobylites, Chernobyl children, Chernobyl refugees. But you don't know anything about us. You're afraid of us. You probably wouldn't let us out of here if you had your way. In those first days, I took my daughter and ran off to Minsk to my sister. My own sister didn't let us into her home. I had crazy thoughts. 
Where should we go? Maybe we should kill ourselves so as not to suffer. Everyone started imagining horrible diseases, unimaginable diseases. And I'm a doctor. I can only guess at what other people were thinking. Now I look at my kids. Wherever they go, they'll feel like strangers. My daughter spent a summer at pioneer camp. The other kids were afraid to touch her. People talk about the war, the war generation. They compare us to them. But those people were happy. They won the war. They weren't afraid of anything. They wanted to live, learn, have kids. Us, we're afraid of everything. We're afraid for our children, for our grandchildren, who don't exist yet. They don't exist and we're already afraid. People smile less. They sing less at holidays. It's a feeling of doom. Alexeyevich's qualitative interviews with residents who lived in the Chernobyl region reveal the same feeling of abandonment by the powers that be, as they scrambled to save some sort of face. The commanders told us, after being exposed to 25M, we will be replaced by other workers. But we were not being replaced. There wasn't 25M. There was 125M. 225M. They told us that once we built the fence around the reactor, we could get out of there. Then a general showed up and told us, Boys, it is better to bury 1,000 than 1 million. You know, I, I talked to some of those scientists. One said, You're flying without protection? You don't want to live too long, do you? Big mistake. Cover yourselves. Another said, uh, I could lick your helicopter with my tongue and nothing would happen to me. Anyway, we... We flew from morning to night. There was nothing spectacular in it, just, just work. Hard work. At night, we watched television. The World Cup is on, so we talked a lot about football. I guess it must have been three years later or so. One of the guys got sick. Then another. Someone died. Another went insane and, and killed himself. That's when we started thinking. I didn't tell my parents I've been sent to Chernobyl. My brother happened to be reading at Spitzia one day and, and saw my picture. He brought it to our mom. Lucky said, he's a hero. My mother started crying. We weren't allowed to take any belongings. Right, I won't. I'll take just one. Just one. I need to take my door to our apartment and take it with us. I can't leave the door. That door was our talisman. My father lay on this door. I'm not sure where this custom comes from, but according to my mother, the dead have to be laid on the door from their home. I sent my daughter and my wife to the hospital. They had black spots all over their bodies. They'd spring up and fade away, the size of a five kopeck piece. But nothing hurt. They did some tests on them. I asked, what's the result then? That's not your concern. <laughs> so whose concern is it then? My daughter had turned six. When I put her to bed, she whispers in my ear, Daddy, I want to live. I'm still little. I didn't think she'd understand anything. Can you picture seven little girls shaved bald in one room? There were seven of them in the hospital room. My wife came back from the hospital. Her nerves snapped. If only she'd die rather than go through this torture. If only... If only I could die so I wouldn't have to see this. We put her on the door. On the door that my father lay on. Until they brought a little coffin. It was small. Like the box for a large doll. My daughter died from Chernobyl and they want us to forget about it. It hasn't been scientifically proved, they say. There isn't enough data. We'll need to wait a hundred years. My life's too short. 
I can't wait that long. Write it down. You record it, at least. My daughter's name was Katya. She was seven years old. The real scar of Chernobyl was the collapse in faith in the system. As authoritative as it was, the USSR did have a vague social contract with its citizens. The people would suffer and bleed and sacrifice, and in return, the party would shelter them from harm. The pain of one was shared by all. The Soviet government's unwillingness to express the true scale of the disaster prevented the Republic's civil defense organizations from acting effectively to protect their populations, and it showed the rot within the Soviet system. People were dragged through the bureaucracy. It required a lot of courage to tell the truth about Chernobyl. It still does, believe me. But you need to see this footage. The blackened faces of the firemen, like graphite, and their eyes. These are the eyes of people who already know that they're leaving us. There's one fragment showing the legs of a woman who the morning after the catastrophe went to work on her plot of land next to the atomic station. She's walking in grass covered with dew. Her legs remind you of a grate. Everything's with holes up to the knees. After the first tests, it became clear that what we were receiving couldn't properly be called meat. It was radioactive byproducts. The milk factories carried out the government plan. We checked the milk. It wasn't milk. It was a radioactive byproduct. For a long time after that, we used dry milk powder and cans of condensed and concentrated milk as examples of a standard radiation source. When people saw that the milk was from Roachov and stopped buying it, there suddenly appeared cans of milk without labels. I don't think it was because they ran out of paper. There was a woman in our group, a radiologist. She became hysterical when she saw that children were sitting in a sandbox and playing. We checked breast milk. It was radioactive. We went into the stores. As in a lot of village stores, they had the clothes and food right next to each other. Suits and dresses and nearby salami and margarine. They're lying there in the open. They're not even covered with cellophane. We take the salami. We take an egg. This isn't food. It's a radioactive byproduct. We asked our supervisors, what do we do? How should we be? They said, Take your measurements. Watch television. On television, Gorbachev was calming people. We've taken immediate measures. I believed it. I'd worked as an engineer for 20 years. I was well acquainted with the laws of physics. I knew that everything living should leave that place, if only for a while. But we conscientiously took our measurements and watched the television. We were used to believing. I'm from the post-war generation. I grew up with this belief, this faith. Why did we keep silent, knowing what we knew? Why didn't we go out onto the square and yell the truth? We compiled our reports, we put together explanatory notes, but we kept quiet and carried out our orders without a murmur because of party discipline. I was a communist. I don't remember that any of our colleagues refused to go work in the zone, not because they were afraid of losing their party membership, but because they had faith. They had faith that we lived well and fairly, that for us man was the highest thing, the measure of all things. The collapse of this faith in a lot of people eventually led to heart attacks and suicides, a bullet to the heart. Because when you lose that faith, you are no longer a participant, you're an also-ran. You have no reason to exist. подлежащих засекречиванию по вопросам, связанным с аварией на блоке номер 4 Чернобыльской АЭС. Сведения, раскрывающие истинные причины аварии на блоке номер 4 ЧАЭС. Anthropologist Alexei Yurchak, in his 2005 book, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, argues that during the final days of Russian communism, the Soviet system had been so successful at propagandizing itself, at restricting the consideration of possible alternatives, that no one within Russian society, be they politicians or journalists, academics or citizens, could conceive of anything but the status quo until it was far too late to avoid the collapse of the old order. The system was unsustainable, 
This was obvious to anyone fighting in Afghanistan, or waiting in line for bread, or working in the halls of the Kremlin. But in official, public life, such thoughts went unexpressed. Yurchak coined the term hypernormalization to describe this process, an entropic acceptance and false faith in a clearly broken polity and the myths that undergird it. Decades of propaganda asserted the USSR's nuclear power plants demonstrated the country's high level of technological mastery, fulfilling decades-old Bolshevik promises to electrify the entire country and bring fairy tales to life. To suggest that these facilities might threaten citizens' health and well-being constituted not merely a contradiction of the party line, but a challenge to the legitimizing myths of Soviet power. Chernobyl, in other words, threatened to shatter the hypernormal. While some Soviet organizations, such as civil defense, measured risk from the accident largely in terms of physical damage to Soviet lives and property, others, such as the KGB, preoccupied themselves with more nebulous threats, such as embarrassing revelations about the failures and oversights of the Soviet government. Declassified KGB documents published by the Sectorial State Archive of the Secretary Service of Ukraine, the Institute of History of Ukraine, the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, and the Ukrainian Institute of National Memory reveals the overriding goal of the Soviet political establishment was to protect the Soviet system. The cause of the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is the human factor, not the technological errors. The propaganda hype of the West around the accident is clearly anti-Soviet. The information disseminated among the personnel of the Chernobyl nuclear power station and other organizations and the contamination of its environs with cesium-137 may become the property of the enemy's special services, in connection with which it would be advisable to inform the institution about possible actions by anti-Soviet foreign organizations for the early preparation of counter-propaganda activities on this issue. 26 areas of study around Chernobyl were deemed classified by the KGB and buried, including information revealing the true causes of the accident in block number four of Chernobyl, summary of information about rates of sickness in all forms of people subjected to activity in the period of the accident and elimination of its effects, and information about mass poisoning and epidemic sickness rates connected to the accident. Foreign journalists who arrived in the Ukrainian capital tried to talk with ordinary passers-by, but instead would interact with uniformless agents who told them the right things. The KGB secretly replaced soil sample probes with non-radioactive ones, even to ostensible allies like the official press organ of the French Communist Party, L'Humanité. One of the main things the KGB buried the lead on was the health effect of Chernobyl. The first major study by the Ukrainian Academy of Scientists into the health risks reads, What worries us is the side effects of radioactivity on the immune system and bone marrow. Weakening of the immune system can lead to an increase in the number of infectious diseases and an exacerbation of chronic inflammatory processes. This will affect primarily children from 10 to 12 years old and the elderly. Due to the effect on bone marrow, anemia may occur, which in one to three years can lead to an increase in the incidence of leukemia. Based on this, we can conclude that the number of cancer cases in the next five, six, eight, ten years will increase two or three times. It can also be assumed that the average life expectancy in Ukraine will decrease by one to two years. This document would be classified for 30 years. Science, or rather the obscuring of science, was an instrument of state power. In contrast to the disorder marking the cleanup efforts and the comparably disordered political and social context, official pronouncements have tended to portray a sense of certainty about Chernobyl's health toll, while characterizing public fears as being largely irrational. The 2005 UN report could have been the opportunity to give much-needed consensus and clarity for those who were the victims of Soviet misinformation and begin the healing process between those affected and those in a position to help. Instead, the narrative set by the UN report implies that the misinformation sown by the KGB is not a valid concern of the populations who suffered as a result of it and argues the welfare programs set up by Belarus, Ukraine and Russia, supporting some 7 million people in total, are going to people who don't actually need to be claiming them. The report argues persistent myths and misconceptions about the threat of radiation have resulted in paralyzing fatalism. The designation of the affected population as victims rather than survivors has led them to perceive themselves as helpless, weak, and lacking control over their future. The reports are, in other words, blaming the Ukrainian and Belarusian people for their own suffering. They took big structural failures, the structural failures that created Chernobyl, the structural failures that deliberately manufactured ambiguity of harm, the unraveling of the USSR, and blamed the people suffering from the consequences of those structural failures. And they used it to push market austerity onto people. The World Bank has, for some time, been arguing for the drastic reductions of state social welfare funds. In 1997, the World Bank's The State in a Changing World report effectively called the Chernobyl compensation system dead weight on Ukraine's less than ideal market transition. They argued Ukraine needed to cut social spending and privatize its welfare programs, especially its pension schemes. 
In their 2002 report on Belarus's Chernobyl programs, the World Bank was critical of Belarus providing free school meals, free dental care, and monthly allowances to Chernobyl victims, as well as Belarus deciding to lower the retirement age for liquidators. They were also critical of mass screening programs being run by the Belarusian government to track cancer incidence rates in their population. They said it wasn't fiscally sustainable and that it was too easy to qualify as a victim. They linked this to a wider plan to privatize the economy, cut taxes, halt mass medical screenings, slash welfare programs, including stopping free dental services and prescriptions, and means testing Chernobyl benefits, which, because of the difficulty linking Chernobyl radiation with ill health, effectively meant stopping them. The 2005 World Health Organization report seemed to give scientific legitimacy to the austerity narrative and a green light for then Ukrainian Prime Minister Yushchenko to pursue an austerity program that could cut the social expenditure of Chernobyl's welfare programs, which made up between 5 and 8% of Ukraine's government spending. The World Health Organization report reads like a spit in the face to so many people in the region because it fails to actually acknowledge the tragedies people have endured at the hands of the disaster. Now they were being pushed around by the West and being forced to accept humiliation at the hands of the market. What these people wanted, what they needed, was a system that could protect them from contamination and from the brutality of a market transition. And it was a brutal transition. From 1989 to 1994, crude death rate increased by more than 20% in Russia, Latvia, Moldova, Ukraine, Estonia, Belarus, and Lithuania. Russian statistics show a sharp increase in anemia in pregnant women, a sharp increase in the proportion of babies born ill or who fall ill shortly after birth, and a steady growth in the 1990s of the proportion of low birth weight babies. Life expectancy in the region collapsed. As the UN Development Programme and UNICEF found, in many settlements visited by the mission, living conditions were far from conducive to good health. The economic shock caused by free market reforms played no small part in causing the widespread unrest seen during Russia's constitutional crisis and a resurgence of the Communist Party in Russia's 1995 parliamentary elections. It also created the conditions for the 1994 general strike in Belarus. Following the liberalization of the market in 1992, Ukrainian household financial savings were wiped out by hyperinflation. Half of the population were thrown into unemployment. In 2001, 50% of the Ukrainian population lived below the poverty line. One cash-starved toy manufacturer in Belarus had to resort to paying his staff part of their wages in soft toys. I do fucking defend Soviet power, the people's power. When we had Soviet power, everyone was afraid of us. What have we got today? Now, under democracy, Snickers. Rancid margarine, they pass off on us. Out of date medicines or worn jeans, treating us like natives who just climbed out of the fucking trees. A loaf of bread under the communists cost 20 kopecks. Now it's 2,000 rubles. I could buy a bottle of vodka for 3 rubles and still have enough for a bite. Under the Democrats, I've been saving for 2 months and still can't afford a pair of trousers. I walk around in a ragged sweater. They sold everything off. Pond it. I don't want any of your tales. Democracy. They did away with censorship. You can write anything you want. A free man. Well, if this free man dies, there is no money for his funeral. The sort of characterization advanced by the World Health Organization report tends to deny affected populations the respect that their actions are due. Had there been a greater focus on the lived experiences of the region, it might have occurred to those writing the report that gaining the status of a Chernobyl sufferer and being paid compensation didn't create fatalism. It was a firewall that gave people the means of dealing with the enormous hardships caused by a brutal transition to a market economy where all jobs and industry vanished overnight and people's real income collapsed. 
Hell, consider the following. The International Atomic Energy Agency's claim that Chernobyl is responsible for the region's fatalism is undermined by the fact that the most vocal opponents to Chernobyl's closure were Chernobyl workers. Workers at Chernobyl were well paid by Ukrainian standards. They earned enough to make it possible to survive in the new market economy with its extremely high prices. The proposed closure of the plant meant the prospect of personal economic disaster. Workers remained at the plant, even though they absorbed high doses of radiation, information that they withheld from their doctors. As long as they were employed by the Chernobyl plant, engineers and workers could pay their bills. If the plant closed, they'd end up on the street. Chernobyl compensation is not even a good firewall either. Most people can't survive on their Chernobyl welfare, which makes it difficult to see how it creates a culture of dependency. It's not dependable. Ukraine pays monthly compensation to those in contaminated areas so people can buy clean food. One of the reasons Chernobyl population suffered such high rates of thyroid cancer was because food shortages in the USSR meant a lot of the residents were iodine deficient. Their iodine-starved thyroids sucked up any iodine that became available. But the compensation to buy clean food isn't enough. The payments have been fixed at the same amount since the 1990s. Adjusted for inflation, those compensatory payments are worth pennies, so people fish and farm in contaminated areas. As Dr. Jim Smith from the University of Portsmouth recounts about his time studying Lake Koshanovskoy in Russia, fish in the lake have cesium concentrations far above permissible levels. But when he asked the fisherman why he was eating the fish, he responded, what do you expect me to eat? The residents of contaminated areas choose to stay put, to eat contaminated food, to live in contaminated regions, not because they don't appreciate the potential risk, but because the alternative of being relocated and relying on piecemeal government support would mean severing the social networks that keep them alive. Economic assistance from Western countries was tied specifically to replacing Soviet reactors with Western ones and imposing market austerity onto people, rather than giving the people what they needed. Jobs, industry, security. To many living in the former Soviet sphere, the International Atomic Energy Agency wasn't there to provide scientific judgment, but was there to enforce austerity economics and support a kind of nuclear extortion by the West. It isn't helped by the fact that the World Health Organization report was, in many ways, reflective of the report written to the Central Committee in 1987 that also argued they had not found any illnesses attributable to radiation. Much like paralyzing fatalism, increases in circulatory diseases and thyroid problems identified in patients studied by the All Union Scientific Center of Radiation Medicine was attributed to the psycho-emotional factor. This would later be dubbed radiophobia. But by 1989, due to the combination of events we've already discussed and the burying of information on health and environmental consequences by the KGB and Boris Shabina, yes, the very same, meant the efforts of the Central Committee report to assure the public the impacts were minimal had been undermined. There's a palpable sense from the communities who live in the shadow of Chernobyl that they are being overlooked by the international community, that their accounts of events and their experiences aren't worth listening to. It feels like another thing imposed from without. Acknowledging the reality that people in these areas are suffering far more from the political fallout of the Soviet Union's collapse than the actual fallout of Chernobyl is important, but it's worth remembering that we lost sight of the goal to figure out how we can best be accountable to those who never asked to be collateral damage. Chernobyl didn't create fatalism. What happened at Chernobyl happened to Cordova. People were abandoned and saw their communities turn on each other because creating ambiguity of harm was necessary to push political agendas, be it faith in the Soviet system or faith in the market. Someone said to me, or maybe I read it, that the problem of Chernobyl presents itself first of all as a problem of self-understanding. I keep waiting for someone intelligent to explain it to me, the way they enlighten me about Stalin, Lenin, Bolshevism, or the way they keep hammering away at their market, market, free market. But we, we who were raised in a world without Chernobyl, now live with Chernobyl. This world is at a tremble with his strength and mighty power. They're sending up to heaven to get the brimstone fire. Take warning, my dear brother, be careful how you plan. You're working with the power of God's own holy hand. Atomic power!
Deep decarbonization isn't easy. In the face of catastrophic climate change, we need to think about how we can best get carbon out of our economies. Most projections indicate our future energy needs will be met with renewable energy, but serious gaps remain within renewable energy technology, particularly regarding storage and variability. Given the window of time we have to cut emissions to stand a chance of being within one and a half degrees, we need to make difficult decisions about how we achieve our best case climate scenario. Following Fukushima, democratic pressure in Germany forced the CDU coalition to drop its previous commitment to nuclear energy and readopt the nuclear phase-out brought in by the Social Democratic Green Coalition in the year 2000. This huge phase-out saw nuclear energy initially replaced with solar and wind, but the 25 terawatts of nuclear energy taken off German grids in 2012 was largely replaced by coal, and many shortfalls in supply have been plugged with fossil fuels as a result. It's worth stressing here, Germany's renewable energy transition is working, despite what some people will tell you. Its power sector emissions are significantly lower than they were since their nuclear phase-out began. Renewable energy is successfully filling the gap left by nuclear power and displacing coal and gas from Germany's energy mix. And this is true of other large economies. The UK is the fastest decarbonizing member of the G7 at time of recording. The red line shows the carbon intensity of the UK's electric grid since 1990, and behind it, how the UK's energy mix has changed. Almost all of the UK's decarbonizing is being done with wind power. But Germany shuttering its nuclear power plants in favor of a fully renewable grid has had consequences. A 2019 analysis concluded the nuclear phase-out led to 1,100 avoidable deaths per year in Germany due to increased air pollution in the years after 2010, and it's undoubtedly made Germany's transition to a zero-carbon energy sector harder. Post-COVID German emission rebounds in the power sector are being driven by a return to cheap lignite-fired power plants. In addition, average wind conditions in the first half of 2021, in contrast to the particularly wind-yielding months of 2020, resulted in a decline in wind power generation compared to the previous year. Germany shows us the discontents of decarbonization plans that exclude nuclear energy. We need every option on the table to deal with climate change. Taking one of our best zero-carbon options off the table is madness. Nuclear power may have finally found its raison d'etre, a low-carbon energy source that can provide stable, firm power to communities for decades and cover the shortfalls of a renewable-dominated grid. The International Energy Agency says nuclear will need to add 15 gigawatts a year to grids between now and 2050 for a total of 600 gigawatts capacity globally, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has similarly said nuclear will need to expand its share of energy in nearly all of our 1.5 degree scenarios. That means keeping old plants online and building new ones. At present, nuclear has two huge stumbling blocks, one economic, one democratic. In the UK, despite having both major political parties support nuclear power, along with the support of the trade unions, businesses, and a largely ambivalent public, between 2008 and 2018, nuclear power's share of British electrical capacity dropped from 10.7% to 8.3%. The current UK government is throwing its weight behind offshore wind. We believe that in 10 years' time, offshore wind will be powering every home in the country you heard me right. Your kettle, your washing machine, your cooker, your heating, your plug-in electric vehicle, a whole lot of them, will get their juice cleanly and without guilt from the breezes that blow around these islands. The shift is thanks in no small part to the fact that offshore wind has been very responsive to market-driven carbon solutions. Nuclear power hasn't. I've talked extensively about nuclear economics. The first thing I made for this channel was a five hour long deep dive comprising eight months of research on the topic that I never ended up releasing. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. But the footnotes version is most new build nuclear power stations are plagued with delays and have prohibitively high startup costs. Nuclear power plants are slow to build, with a plant taking 10 years on average to complete, if you're lucky, and the big bulk of our decarbonization needs need to occur within the next 10 years. To hit the Paris climate goals without geoengineering, we need to cut our emissions in half between 2020 and 2030, possibly faster, which means nuclear's role in rapid decarbonization is limited to a supporting one. Unless small modular reactors significantly reduce these construction times, which isn't guaranteed, we simply can't build nuclear power plants fast enough to have our decarbonization efforts spearheaded by nuclear power. And they're costly, very costly. Almost all plants under construction have had huge cost overruns. To quote former US Nuclear Regulatory Commissioner Peter Bradford, the first article that I wrote pointing out that a renaissance would consist only of the number of reactors that governments would be hornswoggled into paying for, i.e. that private capital would not be available, was in 2004, many years before Fukushima. 
In the US, the 31 new reactor applications filed at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission at the height of the Renaissance euphoria had dwindled by two-thirds before Fukushima and is now down to four actually being built. The EPR fiascos in Finland and France owed nothing to Fukushima. Hinckley was not swayed by Fukushima and never made economic or energy policy sense. It is teetering now because the cost and financial concerns entirely unrelated to the events in Japan. The deregulated power generation markets that have taken shape over the past two decades have little appetite for nuclear power's combination of high build costs, low running costs, and uncertain future liabilities. Conventional light water reactors are capital intensive, long-lived infrastructure that requires central planning, cheap money, and long operating times to pay off. Plants in existence are finding themselves increasingly uncompetitive in free market settings where cheap natural gas is disincentivizing new nuclear builds and persuading investors not to keep unprofitable plants open. More than one-third of the US's nuclear plants are unprofitable or scheduled to close. If they're replaced by natural gas, as many of them have been, emissions will rise, with serious consequences for the climate. The industry as it currently exists is ill-aligned to deal with these issues due to the misplaced political objective of achieving private ownership and competition. National governments see nuclear as a strategic industry and won't let jobs wither away to competitors. Selling nuclear reactors to other countries becomes an arm of foreign policy. There are too many reactor designs offered by lots of different companies, all with a small number of orders and all of which are too expensive. The cold hard truth is spending 7 to 12 billion dollars on a 1 gigawatt power plant that takes 10 years to build and 60 years to pay for itself is a bad investment when you can spend 1 to 2 billion on a 1 gigawatt wind farm that takes 2 to 3 years to build and 5 to 10 years to pay for itself or around 1 billion on a 1 gigawatt solar farm that takes 2 years to build and 5 to 10 years to pay for itself. The market, in other words, doesn't properly value low carbon energy. When Hitachi shelved their plans for a new nuclear plant in Wilfer, their shares jumped 13%. That's fixable. At the bare minimum, a high degree of standardization with a small handful of reactor designs and a fully internationalized supply chain could allow us to build more reactors at lower cost. But whether it's old or new reactors, getting a standardized nth of a kind reactor isn't likely so long as the reactors in question are one gigawatt, multi-billion dollar propositions competing in balkanized electricity markets. We can go further. Low carbon energy standards, carbon taxes, nuclear power bursaries, nationalization of nuclear power, or even full de commodification of energy can protect it from the perverse economics killing both our planet and the means we can save it. It's the democratic part I'm concerned by. The loudest voices regarding nuclear energy aren't from Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth. The loudest voices are from those who blindly believe technology is always improving our lives. The ones who believe the siren calls of nuclear power as the foundation to a world with access to limitless energy. The ones that tell us a Chernobyl could never happen, seemingly forgetting that it did. These voices argue the reason nuclear power is failing is because it's drowning under red tape. Severe accidents are so unlikely they scant require planning. The major drivers of cost are expensive containment domes and other non-specific safety measures we don't need. They say we don't need to commit to safety rules, or innovation for that matter. Forget Generation 4 reactors, hell, forget Gen 3. Generation 2 reactor types were just fine. Regulators need to get off the industry's back. These voices carry far more echoes of their Soviet counterparts than they might care to admit. Коммунизм — это значит советская власть плюс электрификация всей страны. Вот электрификация — это атомная энергия, плюс советская власть, и значит коммунизм. Through a political lens, the core of the Chernobyl disaster is anchored in the Soviet military-industrial complex. Gorbachev didn't start his premiership promising perestroika. Perestroika roughly translates to reconstruction, and it referred to the reconstruction of the Soviet's economic system. But at the 27th Congress, Gorbachev, like Brezhnev before him, favored uskorenya, acceleration. Gorbachev imagined the Soviet system using the power of technology to double productivity and end the shortages in consumer goods. The proposal for overcoming decades of stagnation was shifting away from fossil fuels to nuclear energy. 
The shift to nuclear energy was pushed in part because the Institute of Nuclear Energy was all but owned by Shredmash, aka the Soviet Ministry of Media and Machine Building, real name, a big arm of the Soviet military industrial complex. They wanted to retain their monopoly on high tech industries and products and saw its chance to expand into the Soviet economic sphere through nuclear power. The reactor tasked with ending the shortages of the Soviet economy was the RBMK. The Soviets knew they had a safer option in water-water energy reactors. Scientists knew about the RBMK's positive void coefficient. They knew way back in 1973 when the void coefficient was first observed in Leningrad's RBMK. They knew the RBMK emergency shutdown button, the AZ-5, wasn't designed to bring the reactor's operation to an abrupt stop. They knew that pushing the AZ-5 when the Leningrad reactor ran out of control in 1975 caused a partial meltdown. They knew the reactor was unwieldy. They knew the RBMK had insufficient protective systems compared to French reactors. They knew the lack of of containment dome was an issue. But the Ministry of Media Machine Building suppressed the research. The water-water reactors were slow to build, and the RBMK could be made on-site with locally produced concrete. Its modular design meant the Soviets could build huge 1,000-megawatt reactors cheaper and faster than a 400-megawatt water-water reactor. And acknowledging design flaws may compromise the Ministry's economic ambitions. Besides, water-water reactors weren't as uniquely Soviet as the RBMK was. Water-water reactors were American reactors. Just one day after the partial meltdown in Leningrad, the Soviet Union's Council of Ministers authorized the building of two RBMK reactors in Chernobyl. The Soviet government got their answer to stagnation. Shredmash kept their controls over the production of high-tech products. As far as everyone in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was concerned, the RBMK was a win-win. Chernobyl's construction was rushed, and it routinely cut corners regarding safety standards. The reactor was so difficult to manage, it physically and mentally drained the workers tasked to control it. In 1980, the Research and Development Institute of Power Engineering, or NICIAT, conducted a study that listed nine major failings in the RBMK design that made accidents not only possible, but likely under day-to-day -day operation. But they did nothing. NICIAT, for their part, issued a new set of safety guidelines for the RBMK's operation. RBMK designers argued the reactors were so safe, costs could be reduced even more by building them without the concrete structure that could contain radiation in the event of a reactor failure seen in Western reactors. In the glossy covers of the English-language magazine Soviet Life, the Ukrainian Minister for Energy assured readers that the odds of a meltdown are 1 in 10,000 years. They said you could even put one under Red Square. And we all know what happened next. As Chernobyl faded into history, the voices of the ideologues grew louder. The RBMK reactor was inherently flawed, they said, and they've all either been taken offline or undergone significant modifications to render them safe. Safety procedures at power plants have improved. New reactors offer a level of safety nuclear engineers could only have dreamed of in 1986. Nuclear power can't get any safer. After all, Chernobyl can't happen here. You'd think with Fukushima, a lesson would have been learned. But it wasn't. The same conversations we had on April 26, 1986 started almost immediately. Two narratives arose. One said Fukushima was a cascade of improbable bad luck. A disaster like this could never happen in the US or Europe. Nobody could have imagined one of the largest earthquakes in history triggering a huge tsunami that floods a low-lying coastal nuclear plant. Nobody had envisioned an accident involving multiple reactors. Nobody had assumed such an event could involve a loss of power for more than a few hours. Another narrative said nuclear power is a folly and a mistake. We're right to fear the atom because we simply don't know what we're doing. Fukushima wasn't an act of God, it is the irredeemable failures of an inherently unsafe technology. I'd like to offer a third narrative. Nuclear plants aren't houses of cards waiting for the first gust of wind or ground tremor to collapse. Fukushima Daiichi was a well-defended nuclear plant by accepted standards with robust, redundant layers of protection. When Fukushima melted down, the evacuation was swift and decisive. The current death toll at Fukushima is 573. Only one is the result of radiation. However, Fukushima wasn't a Japanese nuclear accident. It was an accident that happened to occur in Japan. Fukushima shouldn't have happened at all. A large earthquake and tsunami in one of the most tectonically active parts of the planet in a nation hit by regular earthquakes and tsunamis meant the probability of a cataclysmic event should have been treated as a certainty. A complacent and poorly regulated industry, one that considered such an event unlikely, one that thought it wasn't worth the cost and time to predict against such an event, one that didn't consider the possibilities of multiple failures to safety controls all occurring at once, left Fukushima dangerously unprepared when an earthquake and subsequent tsunami hit in March 2011. 
And because of the industry's complacency, Japan reneged on its climate obligations, its emissions spiked, and progress on reducing emissions has been slowed for everyone. At its core, <laughs> nuclear power comes with potential risks. Small risks, risks we can mitigate, but real ones. Is expanding nuclear power, with all the potential risks that entails, worth it when we contemplate the very real threat of climate breakdown? For me, yeah. It's absolutely worth it. Given nuclear's position as a reliable low-carbon energy source, expanding it is 100% worth doing if it helps us avoid climate collapse. And those with an interest in advancing nuclear power as a source of energy need to look past their own biases and not listen to the nuclear cargo cult telling us it can't happen here. Nuclear power will only be successful through the vision of the realists who acknowledge its problems and work hard to fix them. The lesson of Chernobyl isn't that nuclear power is dangerous, because it's not. Statistically, it's one of the safest forms of energy we have, and the air pollution it keeps out of the atmosphere has saved thousands of lives. Air pollution from fossil fuels kills 4 million people every single year. Depending on who you ask, that's between 250 and 1,000 Chernobyls every single year. We're at far greater risk from the stuff coming out of our cars than anything coming out of a nuclear plant. Chernobyl is a lesson in how our hubris makes us forget to treat nuclear technology with the respect it deserves. It's a lesson in how we need to avoid the siren calls of easy fixes, reject the nationalism that says it can't happen here, and embrace cooperation on atomic energy. It's a lesson in how we need to strengthen international control over the construction of nuclear power stations to ensure those technologies work for the betterment of all humankind. Ten years on from Fukushima, we seem determined to learn nothing and those who are pro-nuclear, myself included, have to answer the question. When we ask how many people died because of Chernobyl, to what end are we even asking? Are we asking to avoid another Chernobyl? To encourage us to develop fourth generation nuclear? To remind ourselves a well-regulated industry is in everyone's interests? To create a more transparent industry that can grapple with the injustices of its history? To encourage international cooperation on nuclear power? To address the legacy issues that caused progressive movements to reject nuclear energy to begin with? To engage with the communities who have suffered at the hands of nuclear accidents and treat them with empathy and respect? Or are we turning Chernobyl's victims into political pawns? What story are we trying to tell? Я думаю, ни у кого не будет сомнений, что ни для припечан, ни для участников ликвидации последствий аварии боязнь радиации уже с ними не совместим. Значит, остается что? Болезненная память. Но ведь это нормальное человеческое состояние. У нас есть Много уже уроков прошлого, когда мы пытались заглушить память о каких-то трагических моментах. Так вот, неужели нам нужно еще, еще новые встряски, чтобы мы не, не заглушали боли не вот этих бед? То, что говорилось здесь о детях, о детях, живущих на грязной территории, еще вокруг зоны, и о наших детях, что, например, мой ребенок, живший в Пеловом микрорайоне, И в городе Припяти бывший абсолютно здоров теперь имеет целый букет хронических заболеваний. Таких детей очень много, детей моих знакомых и так далее. Об этом все молчат, говорят у нас дети совершенно здоровые, об этом тоже надо говорить. И обо всем, обо всем, что еще осталось, нужно говорить. И корни, которые вскрыла Чернобыльская трагедия, мы не имеем права зарывать в землю. Так вот, после очередного выступления, как раз в газете товарища Ильина, Вот два года спустя, Чернобыль два года спустя, накопившаяся вот эта вот горечь и боль выразилась в таких стихах, которых, пожалуй, дается определение этого нового термина. Радиофобия. 